Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining me. I'm so delighted to be joined today by Mustafa Barghouti, who is a veteran Palestinian uh, politician who has fought for a very long time um, for an independent, progressive Palestine. Uh, Mustafa, it's great to, to be joined by you. Firstly, just so people will have seen you on television, a lot of your video, your, your interviews have gone viral in the last few weeks. But just so people are aware, you actually represent an alternative to both Hamas, which is dominant in, obviously runs Gaza, and also Fatah, which is dominant in the West Bank. So can you just explain that to people so they understand? Well, I, uh, am, a, I am one of the founders and I'm leading now the Palestinian National Initiative, which is the youngest Palestinian political party in terms of age. It's 20 years old. And it was initiated by a number of people uh, like uh, the well-known intellectual Edward Said and uh, uh, Haider Abdel Shafi, who used to be the head of the Palestinian negotiating team in Madrid, and uh, and many other political leaders who thought that uh, Palestine needs a third alternative, uh, that uh, this polarization between Hamas and Fatah uh, is not healthy. And there needs there are there is a substantial amount of people who want to 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 have a different vision and a, a different view from what the authority represents, which is Fatah in this case, and uh, and Hamas. It doesn't mean that we are in antagonism with them, and it's just that the, there is a certain silent majority in the Palestinian society which needs a different alternative. And uh, this movement, which was initiated in two thousand two during the difficult time of the Intifada, second intifada and the israeli invasions uh, is uh, first of all it uh, took a very strong stand against oslo agreement because we thought it was a big mistake second it's uh, it has a program that includes three aspects one is freedom of course from israeli occupation and the system of apartheid second it's uh, the need for a democratic internal system uh, where we have pluralism, where we have separation of powers, where we have people's participation and, of course, elections. But third, it's a strong uh, movement on the issue of social justice, women's rights, uh, the rights of uh, poor people, how to fight poverty, the rights of workers, the, the rights of women. Uh, so it's, it's a young movement. 80% uh, of its members are uh, young women and uh, and uh, young uh, and youth and uh, we've just had our congress in uh, on the 17th of January this year which uh, also elected a rather young leadership uh, with very uh, substantial amount of women in leadership positions so it represents a different kind a different approach but it's very uh, much also a, a movement that tried to unify Palestinians, calling for unified leadership and also unity through democracy, And if I may so, say so. Before we ask you about the wider context, because there's been a liberal attempt by those defending Israel's onslaught to start the clock on what happened on the 7th of October, can I just ask you, in terms of what's happened in Gaza over the last couple of days, and obviously the, the Israel cutting off communications, a vicious onslaught. Just your thoughts on the humanitarian catastrophe that has now enveloped Gaza as a consequence of Israel's onslaught. It is very sad to watch what's happening in Gaza because you are talking about a mighty Israeli army which is allocating almost 450,000 soldiers with the most sophisticated weapons in the world all the American jet fighters and the most sophisticated tanks and a huge intelligence system against uh, basically civilian population of 2.3 million people who live in a very small area that is no more than 140 square miles. As a matter of fact, it's much less than that because Israel has imposed a security zone within Gaza and around Gaza of 25 percent and and so it's very small area with the highly with the most densely populated area in the world and they're using all this huge military arsenal uh, bombarding the place with with airstrikes with artillery with tanks and uh, conducting basically three war crimes 
the first war crime is genocide through this terrible bombardment. Uh, to give your audience an idea, the amount of explosives that have been thrown on Gaza the last 21 days is equal to the uh, to the to the power of the nuclear bomb that was thrown on Hiroshima during the Second World War. Uh, unbelievable destruction. Uh, basically, 50% of all houses in Gaza have already been destroyed partially or completely. Many institutions, hospitals, universities, uh, 56 uh, health clinics and health centers have been destroyed. Uh, 25 ambulances have been hit. Uh, we lost already 110 of our health workers during these strikes. 24 journalists were also killed. But the total number of people killed has already exceeded 8,000 civilians, uh, including no less than 3,200 children. And what breaks my heart is that uh, almost 1,500 people are still under the rubble probably including 700 children whom, who cannot be taken out from that place because of the continuous bombardment. But the other war crime that is happening is the collective punishment against the 2.3 million people, depriving them from water, electricity, uh, medical supplies, fuel, and oxygen bottles that are very much needed in hospitals. Uh, the need of Gaza is uh, about uh, 500 trucks of supplies every month, every day. And uh, uh, given that we haven't had anything for 22 days, actually Gaza needs now 1,100 trucks. All that Israel allowed to pass is 84 trucks only. And they did, do not allow a single drop of fuel to go into Gaza. Hmm. The result of that is just beyond belief. You're talking, for instance, uh, 120 children could die in incubators because there is no electricity in the hospitals. Well, more than 1,100 people need kidney dialysis and they can die at any moment, including 34 children. Uh, we are now anticipating the spread of ep epidemics in Gaza, uh, waterborne, dise waterborne diseases because of the destruction of sewage system, etc. And uh, we're expecting uh, a very serious amount of hepatitis, maybe measles, because vaccination is uh, has stopped completely for 22 days, and uh, more even serious diseases like cholera. Uh, but the third, the third process that Israel is doing is ethnic cleansing. I mean, they have tried to push all of the people of Gaza to Egypt, but Egypt took a very strong stand against that, and people refused to leave because 70% of the people in Gaza are already refugees who have been ethnically cleansed by Israel in 1948, and, and, and they don't want to be refugees again. But the result is bombardment and bombardment, and Israel, today Netanyahu in his press conference said, all people in the north and middle of Gaza should go to the south, but he's bombarding the south as well. So there is no safe place anywhere in Gaza. It's a total humanitarian disaster. And now what you mentioned, the last step is to cut off all forms of telecommunications and internet. Even when Elon Musk declared that he wants to provide a satellite network to the humanitarian internationally recognized institutions like UNICEF and WHO, uh, Israel responded that they will not allow this to happen and they will block that. So why do they do that? Because they want a complete blackout to cover the, all the crimes they are committing against the civilian population of Gaza. The British and American governments were very strong in condemning the actions of the of Putin's forces in Ukraine, and yet now refuse to not only condemn violations of international law, the Geneva Convention, for example, um, committed by Israel in Gaza, but refuse to call for a ceasefire. I mean, what, what's your view on that? The fact Western governments have lined up behind Israel and refuse to condemn what you've just described, um, which do stand in violation of international law. Before I respond to that, I want to say what is shocking to us so much is why the Prime Minister of Britain and the British government and the United States government are, are vehemently against a ceasefire. 
which could stop the atrocity and save not only Palestinian but Israeli lives as a matter of fact. Why? Why they could, they want the continuation of this war? And of course, uh, the Western government's position regarding the situation in Ukraine and, and Palestine is a very clear example of the double standard. And by the way, it's not the first time. We, we've seen similar double standard before uh, when uh, Iraq occupied Kuwait. But in this case, they are providing $224 billion to Ukraine, saying that it is uh, fighting Russia, uh, fighting Russian occupation. But in our case, they are providing all the military support, including sending aircrafts and aircraft carriers to the Mediterranean to support Israel by supporting the occupier, not the occupied. So in one case, they say that they are supporting somebody who fights occupation. And in another case, they are supporting the occupier who is occupying us, the Palestinians, since 56 years and who has ethnically cleansed 70% of the Palestinian population in, uh, 75 years ago. So the double standard here is absolutely clear. And uh, what is more even shocking to, is to see a person like Zelensky supporting Israel and supporting occupation. I mean, that sends a message that there is no international law and no international standard here, that this is the law of jungle. Whoever mm. has power can do whatever they want. Um, for those who've defended what the onslaught committed unleashed by Israel, they would say, look, Israel has attacked on the 7th of October, atrocities, terrible atrocities were committed by Hamas. This is self-defense. How do you respond to, to that general argument? Well, you know my position. I'm a person who advocates nonviolence all my life, and I am against killing any civilian, whether Israeli or Palestinian. But history did not start on the 7th of October, and uh, Guterres was very correct, the General Secretary of the United Nations, when he said that this did not come from a vacuum. It happened because there is 56 years of occupation, oppression. 40 years ago, there, Hamas did not exist, as a matter of fact. And at that time, PLO was classified as a terrorist organization. As a matter of fact, not only Hamas is classified as a terrorist group in the American Congress, but also the PLO that uh, Mr. Biden is meeting the president of. So it's the, the problem here is that this happened because of occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing of Palestinian people. It was a response. And, and then Israel responded. OK, they responded. Fine. Uh, already 8,000 people are killed and uh, more than 3,000 children. So, so why to continue? How many more children they have to kill? Do, what, is, what is the exchange rate they are looking for? As, as, as one person said in a Pierce Morgan interview. What is the exchange rate? How many Palestinians should die to satisfy Israel that lost 310 soldiers in that attack and, and uh, about 1,100 uh, civilians? The problem here is that they continue the bloodshed. And uh, before that, let's remember how many Palestinians were killed since 1948. 120,000 people by Israel. How many Palestinians were put in jail since 1967? one million Palestinians. How can this happen? And then they say that Israel has the right to, to defend itself. Okay, Israel has the right to defend itself, but don't Palestinians have the right to defend themselves? And if you are under occupation and oppression and you resist occupation, isn't that your right according to international law? So no, they don't want to allow us to resist in any possible way. If we, if Palestinians use military struggle as Hamas did, they call them terrorists. If they use nonviolent resistance as I do, they call us violent. If we resist even with words, they call us provocators. If you as a British person is in solidarity with Palestinians, they will call you anti-Semite. And if you are a Jewish person, and there are many of those who are supportive of the Palestinian rights, you will be called self-hating Jew. It's a Zionist ideology that tries to send one message. As, as the foreign minister of Israel said in the United Nations, Cohen, he said, 
from now on, there is no place for balanced positions. Either you are with us or you are our enemies. It, that's the kind of thinking. And let me let me say, I'm sorry to say that, but I have to say it. This, this kind of thinking is nothing but a fascist kind of thinking. Either you are with me or you are my enemy. That's just one final question. In terms of the demands you'd like to see those in countries such as Britain and the United States, it's an, important to make the point that Israel is armed by countries such as the United States and Britain, as well as having, I would say, priceless amounts of diplomatic support and coverage, not just in terms of what's happened since the 7th, but failures to take a stand against the illegal settlements, which are against international law across the West Bank. People don't even talk about the brutality being exacted against Palestinian civilians in the West Bank, particularly, for example, in the last few weeks. Um, in terms of the system of apartheid, which Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, the Israeli organization Betzalem have identified, what are the kind of key demands you'd like to hear, given the power that these Western governments have, given their alliance with the Israeli state? What do you want people to be agitating for, organizing and, and calling for? The first thing is to accept us as equal human beings and put aside this racist approach of looking at Palestinians as if we are, uh, as, as the Israeli Defense Minister described us, as uh, human animals, he said. Uh, and and uh, I think this, uh, this, uh, this particular aspect, the racist aspect, is very powerful here among in the camp of those who just unconditionally support Israel, and uh, and I think what we need here uh, from the government of Britain, which by the way carries a very great responsibility historically for Balfour Declaration and for the creation of this problem in the very first place, and with their policy of divide and conquer, which encouraged the, the confrontation between Palestinians and and Jewish people. Uh, in my opinion, what we need now is immediate ceasefire, uh, immediate support of exchange of prisoners, and uh, to support an initiation of a true peace process, not like the ones we've seen before, so far, where Israel was just given the time to finish the process of annexation of the West Bank and sending, sending settlers there. We need a different kind of approach. That's, of course, if the people cares about real peace and the real peace can only be a just peace where palestinians will also have the right of self-determination that's what the united nations decided back in 1947 uh, in their partition plan they decided that israel should have the right of self-determination in 54 percent of the land of palestine and palestinians should have the same right in 44 percent it wasn't just but okay Palestinians accepted eventually 22 percent, mm -hmm. less than half of what the United Nations accept, uh, agreed to give them. And now Israel says not even 5 percent or 2 percent or 1 percent. No place, as Netanyahu says, for a Palestinian state. We will not stop struggling. And that's a message I want to convey. We're suffering. We're losing people. But nothing will break us and nothing will stop our struggle for freedom and for dignity and for our rights. Mustafa, it's a real honor to have you so eloquently, I think, present a case which has been systematically trashed in Western political discourse, which is about the right of the Palestinian people to national self-determination, the racist language and the essentially the level of dehumanization that Palestinians are not even treated as remotely as equal human beings in this so-called debate or discussion. It's so important that you made that point. So thank you so, so much. Please like and subscribe. Thank you, thank you so much, Dermastafa. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.